Welcome everybody. We'll all unveil ourselves from the TSCN. Uh, hello. Hi everyone. Um, I hope we're finding you in a uh, at a time when you're at least um, relatively safe and healthy. And I know a lot has been going on. Um, and we're going to address that on tonight's all hands, uh, both what changes COVID is causing uh, campaigns to make, um, how TFC is adapting, and we'll hear from um, Representative Tellerico from Texas, and we'll talk a little bit also about how um, you guys can get involved and answer your questions. So. Um, without further ado, we'll actually get going. Um, so, there we go. Slides are live. Um, so, I want to lead off this uh, COVID section by kind of talking about the issue in a in a couple of different ways. Obviously, it's uh, pretty much the single the singular thing going on, and and all. Uh, the world is adapting in, in various different ways and campaigns have a sort of unique um, sort of set of issues with it in that they are uh, organizations that come up really rapidly have to do things on a certain timeline raise money spend it in the right way communicate with people often in person uh, toward the deadline that uh, doesn't change in in november um, so even with a pandemic there is still an election coming and campaigns have to be able to activate themselves um, in in the right way, so uh, we'll we'll talk about that from a couple of different point of view, uh, couple of different perspectives. Michael, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so a couple of things off the top is uh, campaigns really rely on in person activity. It's, it's James has probably knocked on thousands of doors in the past uh, few years. Um, it's a key part of how you talk to voters, uh, recruit people into your campaign to volunteer, um, and uh, get folks out to vote. And so that's a key thing that is going away at least for the next couple months. Um, on the fundraising end, uh, folks spend a tremendous amount of time fundraising and uh, events are a big part of how they do that. And those are off the table. Um, from, from our end, there's a major increase in demand for, for digital help. Um, you know, we, we don't do TFC to respond to a pandemic, but it has, has happened so that uh, the type of services that we offer are um, going to be in increased demand. And uh, the amount of folks out there in the world participating in the campaign ecosystem, either through TFC or um, through, through other organizations and, and companies, it's a static talent pool. So we have sort of uh, a crush of uh, interest, uh, a lot of things being taken away. Some things that were sort of part of the mix are now the only thing to do. And everyone um, from top to bottom in the campaign world is is trying to, to navigate that. So to talk to you a little bit about that, um, Brian Brenna Crombie, who recently joined Tech for Campaigns in the past couple of weeks um, as our deputy campaign director. She was actually a, a campaign manager on a Virginia, on a couple of Virginia races that she worked with us um, and that's how we got to know her. Um, so Brenna, you wanna share a bit about your background and, and what you're bringing to the org? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I love campaigns. I've worked on several. Um, and like Greg mentioned, uh, two of my campaigns actually had Tech for Campaigns do all of my digital work, um, which was how we interacted. And now uh, I found myself here. So I've worked in four different states, um, all at different levels from U.S. Senate all the way down to um, state representative. And I absolutely love it. Um, so I have a lot of you know contacts and I've been asking everybody, how has your campaign been affected? What's been going on? What have you been doing that's working? What are you doing that's not working? Um, and I kind of found, um, I kind of consolidated that for you guys to give you guys an update of what I'm seeing on the ground. Um, so I think the biggest thing is state by state, what the governor is doing in that state and dictating, um, depending on how strict um, the, their new rules are or how lenient they're being. Um, I think campaigns are definitely taking direction from them. Um, so that's been a huge difference of some people are just kind of acting like everything's fine and others are completely you know, really taking it very seriously and shutting down. And I think that's depending on the, the state and the governor. Um, and if you break that down even further, incumbents, you're seeing they're busier than ever. Um, they're constantly finding new ways to help the community. They're in communication with their state government. And 
um, their campaigns have, you know, for no fault of their own, kind of shut down in, in different ways because it's hard to do both things. And so um, you have that problem with incumbents that I'm seeing a lot. And then you're also finding with challengers who, you know, don't have a direct job of doing it, but want to help, um, but don't know the right thing to do. So uh, there's a huge range within those two things. Um, and I think there's some great things that we're learning from both sides. Um, some campaign staff has been repurposed to help uh, local schools deliver meals to children. And um, meanwhile, you know, other campaigns are kind of going dark on social media because they, they don't know the right thing to say. So um, there's a huge range and there's definitely, uh, we can only grow from here. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. Um, the other thing that's huge is state legislative campaigns are hurting the most in this universe because they don't have the staff to help them. Um, they don't have, you know, a comms director with their finance director and a, fin and a campaign manager. So they're the ones that are really needing the most help in this atmosphere. So that's and, kind of a little summer. Brenna, from, from your perspective, um, it's, it's sort of just so I'm not the one, <laughs> I'm, the, I'm not the only one repeating myself, but really like digital is the primary and only way to, to communicate a lot um, for pretty much everything right now, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's really the only safe way that um, we should be communicating with voters right now, too. Um, so, yeah, like you said before, events are shut down. Canvassing obviously isn't happening. Um, and people are now kind of either they had a great digital platform that they're just expanding or they're for the first time realizing, oh, maybe I should be posting on Facebook more than once a week. So um, mm -hmm. digital is absolutely the the next biggest step in, in where campaigns should be going this year. Cool. Um, thank you for that. Um, so that's a great segue to an actual real life elected representative, <laughs> Representative James Paul Rico, who represents the uh, 52nd uh, uh, State House District um, and was recently elected in 20, 2018 um, and has been a, a great partner of ours uh, ever since. Um, so What's, you know, what's the transition, like, as somebody, you know, goes around and talks to people, goes to events and stuff, how, what's the transition, like, what's your work from home, like, life like now? Yeah, well, first, thanks for having me. Um, I, I think I've mentioned this on previous Tech for Campaign calls that um, the only reason I'm in this office is because of this organization and all y'all did for a 28-year-old first-time candidate back in 2018. Um, and I'm looking at this picture and I look so carefree before the days of global <laughs> pandemics um, because this is what we all used to look like. Um, but uh, this is my, I, I, I'm uh, working from my home here in Round Rock in the middle of my legislative district. Um, and uh, this, is, this is kind of my little home office I have here, obviously decorated with um, campaign posters, which I thought would appeal to our, our campaign nerds um, on this call. Right. Um, but, uh, but it's going well and um, we're staying busier than ever trying to support constituents, uh, trying to figure out how we're going to uh, legislate in this new environment. Um, so it's, it feels like the work has not slowed down, but um, where we're doing the work has certainly changed. Yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, before we go too deep into the, the COVID realm, because that's obviously the hot topic, but since you um, were just elected the last, last cycle, what's been the highlight of your time in office so far? Yeah. Um, so, you know, before I was a politician, I was a middle school teacher um, and uh, Tech for Campaigns uh, helped me in my first my first race um, kind of use my uh, story as a middle school teacher as a reason for people to vote for me. I remember one of our digital ads was if you want to stop the drama at the state capitol, vote for a middle school teacher, um, which I thought was uh, particularly effective. But you know, I, I ran for this office because I care about uh, education policy and, and um, you know, I went from serving uh, 150 kids in room 112 at Rhodes Middle School on the west side of San Antonio to now serving 5.5 million Texas school children uh, as a member of the Public Education Committee in the Texas House. Um, and, you know, I, I thought my first session that I would just kind of watch and, and listen and learn, um, but I was asked to help um, overhaul our state school finance system on my second week on the job. So I was trying to find the bathrooms at the Capitol, try to figure out who I was gonna eat with at lunch, and was also asked to overhaul a system that hadn't been updated since before I was born. Um, and I, I'm proud to report that we 
um, uh, crafted a, a really uh, remarkable historic transformative bill called House Bill 3, which injected $11.6 billion in new education funding into Texas schools, provided full day pre-K for the first time in Texas history to the kids who need it most, and gave a pay raise to every educator in Texas, an average of $3,800 a year. So, and that, that you know, would not have been possible without some of the people on this call. So I know uh, the work is difficult and tedious at times, but I just want to make sure everybody knows the real impact that the work you do in this organization has on, on real people out there who probably will never know anything about Tech for Campaigns, will never know your names, um, maybe will never know my name, but um, their lives are, are tangibly better uh, because of the work we do. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Um, I mean, now we have a, a sort of obviously more serious, like not that it wasn't serious before, but it's a, it's a serious time now. Um, your priority as a legislator, I know we have a sort of campaign outline here, but your priority as a legislator seems to me like this is really showing off the importance of state government and where, um, you know, like Brian was saying, governor to governor, state to state, you're seeing huge differences in how people react, how fast they react. Um, from your district and also from the from Texas as a whole, what, do you, what are you finding is the most needed thing um, to, to have happen and how are you advocating uh, during this time? Yeah, so I kind of have three different levels of concerns. My first is obviously the immediate concerns of my constituents. And I, you know, it's a, it's a difficult job because I field calls and messages all day long from my neighbors who are losing their jobs, uh, who have family members that are sick and can't get tested. So, you know, stopping um, kind of the bleeding in the situation is first priority. Second, um, in, in kind of the nearer term, is how we're going to handle what looks to be a, uh, an economic depression here in Texas, worse than other states in the nation because of our reliance on oil and gas, um, and how, what that will mean for our state budget in, um, in the next session in, in January of 2021. And then even longer term, I think uh, policymakers and activists and advocates have an obligation now to really question some of the systems that have failed us in this crisis. Um, and, and how our country is, is not set up uh, to take care of one another. You know, we, we talk about how uh, this pandemic has exposed the need for government and democracy, which is true. But I, I think I can say, because this, you know, we have progressives on this call, this crisis has validated the progressive worldview. You know, uh, our conservative friends believe that we are all individuals who are responsible for ourselves. As progressives, we believe we are a community responsible for each other. One of those worldviews has been validated. The other has been, I think, exposed for the bankrupt uh, vision that it is. Um, and so I think taking advantage of that, um, channeling people's frustration, people's pain into something creative and productive um, and transformative is the task of, um, of leaders and of activists, um, which, I, which I consider all of us on this call. So. I, I know we have to get through some short-term challenges. How do you make sure everybody is safe and healthy and fed? Um, we've got to deal with our, our budgets that are going to be in shambles in the next few months. But then longer term, I think we have to kind of question, um, why did some of these systems fail? Why, why were so many of our constituents in such a precarious position that they couldn't survive economically for a week? Um, these, are, these are big questions that this crisis uh, poses to all of us, and I hope we have an answer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so at the same time, you face kind of a need to continue communicating with folks, both on the on the public space side, but also to not let the campaign side fall off um, too much. So from your perspective, either what you're doing or what you're seeing your colleagues doing or what, what challengers um, in other districts are doing, how do you think about communicating on that side, striking the right balance, um, and then ultimately, uh, you know, what re like tactics that you are, or message threads that you find um, to be sort of the right ones to strike during this time? Yeah, and I think we're all working through this and learning in real time. There are two um, uh, paths that I've seen my colleagues take. One is, as, as elected leaders, simply being um, uh, sharers of information, um, transmitting information about where you can go, who you can call, what resources are available, and there's certainly a, a role to play there. 
But the other path, which is one that we've been exploring over the past couple of weeks, uh, which I think is more powerful, which is helping folks make sense of what's happening um, and helping them um, answer big questions that they feel in their heart um, in this moment. Um, what does this mean? Um, what does this say about us? What does it say about our state and our country? That's really, I think, the role of leaders is to help 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 our our constituents um, wrestle with those questions. And so we've, you know, we have not shied away. You know, you can, I'm sure you know some of y'all can can go look at our um, our recent tweets or our Facebook posts, and we're we're kind of tackling big questions about what this says about about our country. And I think that's a that's a good use of time right now. Um, you know, I think, uh, I don't know if it was Rahm Emanuel, uh, President Obama's former chief of staff that coined the phrase, never let a crisis go to waste. And that can feel crass, and we certainly don't, don't mean to um, lose sight of the human reality here. But I think what that means is we're called to, uh, to really channel this into something greater. Um, and, uh, and we saw that in the, in the Great Depression. Uh, we saw it during the Vietnam War. Um, and I think uh, I think the same can be true here if we, as leaders, step up to the plate and show people a better way. Uh, that makes sense to me. On the tactical side, how are you seeing folks shift their thinking? You know, we're always the digital advocates, right? That's why we're, that's why we're here and, and how we got to know you. Um, what role do you think that plays in, in sort of how people digest the changes from you know, what we always try to sort of illustrate in this call is that there's a world that um, many people in the campaign world are, are used to that is firmly offline. Yeah. Um, and, you know, our, our work is to help bring some of that over. What do you think is the most useful thing to be doing for either folks like us or yeah. um, just other people as they're on their, uh, you know, social media? Yeah. So um, as some of you all know that have worked with, with me and our, I, I had the honor of serving as the youngest member of the Texas legislature, one of the uh, first millennials elected to the legislature here in Texas. And so kind of um, digital communication is something that's native to me and to our team and to many of you. And, I, and so this is not news, but I think what this underscores is how do we um, you know, keep our digital communication as human as possible? The strategic and political advantage of door-to-door -door organizing of in-person relational organizing is that human connection and the, the emotional uh, piece, the authenticity of an interaction. Um, and so I think our challenge now because of circumstances is how do we make our digital communication, our digital organizing, our digital connections more human, more authentic, more real than they have been before. So just for examples, um, you know, uh, before we used um, texting as a way of communicating with voters, um, you know, and I regret sometimes in the past our digital, our, our texting uh, communications have been very stilted and fake um, and, uh, and impersonal. Uh, and now we've switched over to just, I now send text to my constituents that says, hey, this is James Tallarico, I'm your local state rep. I just wanted to check on you and your family and see how y'all are doing. Like that's just nothing that we would have ever, a style we never would have used back in the campaign, right? It was always like, this is James Tallarico, I'm running to do this, this, and this, and you, you know, I hope I can count on your boat, which is not how real people talk to each other, right? Um, like that's not how you talk to your neighbor, you'd be like a sociopath if you talk to your neighbor like that, right? Um, or right. Same, same with digital fundraising, or even, you know, our folks are always like, they have big underlying things and exclamation marks, like click here or the world, you know, or, or, or we're gonna yeah. lose, and you know, and, this, and that, so now we've explored like, you know, writing messages that are just, there's no, no bells and whistles, it's just plain text um, written from me personally as a candidate from my heart. And so, I, I don't know, I think this, this could push our, our digital political work in really in a more humane direction, which I think will be more effective and more transformative in the long, in the long run. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, it's always been a, there's a, you never got fired for buying IBM attitude towards some of that sort of traditional messaging of um, like, I don't want to be the one that screwed this up by not going with the, hi, I'm James and I'm running for X, Y, and Z uh, kind of thing. And I think it's crisis is and not letting them go to waste to enable these like uh, sort of um, regime changes in how uh, communication can happen. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the freedom to kind of be yourself online, that's so difficult for candidates, especially older candidates who are unfamiliar with this kind of medium but use humor, you know, show your quirkiness. Like 
that's just something people are so afraid to do in, in, in normal times. And I hope those walls can kind of start to break down. Um, and I hope y'all can help leaders across, across the country start to do that. How do we make our digital communication more human? Because human communication is not possible um, in these circumstances. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we look forward to supporting your, your re-election and the, that of, of many other folks throughout your chamber and throughout the country. And uh, thanks, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you all. And thank you all for the work you all do for my community, for my state, and, and for our country. Thank you, sir. Um, so I was just going to touch a cup on a couple resources that we put out uh, for campaigns um, in the past couple weeks. Um, so if you zoom out, like the things that are kind of the, the problems here are now becoming an opportunity, not to be crossed about it, but it's, it's an opportunity for us to help and increase our impact. Um, so the tech and digital expertise that we've built up over working with 250 campaigns in the past few years, um, it comes from working with a lot of you know folks like James's colleagues, working through that like how to express myself on social media, um, everything from that to you know more sophisticated data analysis. And so the skill set and experience that we've accumulated over that time has been um, is is now kind of a, a good thing to, to activate. Um, second is our scale. So folks like you, uh, the 11,500 volunteers that we have in our network, being able for us to deploy those folks um, to help as many campaigns as possible is a way that we can have more impact, especially in this time of need and, and, and adjust the talent pool a little bit. Um, the second is uh, our cost efficiency is also a great, a great thing um, for most of our candidates. Uh, TFC services are completely free. And especially as they are making that transition and increasing um, digital from being a activity to the activity, uh, uh, cost efficiency is really important, especially when they are potentially not able to fundraise to the same degree um, that they were planning to do before this crisis happened. Um, so in the realm of free, we have a few free resources um, on the next slide that we uh, put out that have had a fantastic response. Um, one is the campaigning during coronavirus guide that's on our website. and um, that goes to a lot of things uh, James talks about, how to be a public resource, how to uh, communicate effectively. Um, some folks are going to be doing webinars just like this for the first time. Um, so we put out a how to run a virtual fundraiser um, uh, and town hall um, guide as well. Uh, luckily, we, we do these all hands every couple of months. And so we've built up a lot of experience on, on how to uh, do them successfully, I hope, uh, to the audience. Um, and, and then what features to use on Zoom and, and things like that. And so some of the campaigns that Brennan and I talk to are, are kind of, they know they need to do this. They know it's a thing, um, but they don't want to screw it up. Um, they want to make that transition successfully and with support. Um, and these documents and conversations, um, the webinar we're going to do for campaigns next Tuesday are all different ways um, that uh, we are going to be able to channel the knowledge um, in a library of, of best practices that we have uh, to be able to help as many people as possible. Um, and, a, and a second thing we're keeping an eye on on the next slide is that uh, we, obviously this crisis is not going away overnight. It's not going away next week. It's probably not going away next month. So um, we're starting to plan for the possibility that we're gonna have a lot more vote by mail uh, than, than would have happened um, before. And what vote by mail means is that instead of tactically, instead of everybody wanting, you know, you're, you're wanting most of your voters to, to vote on, on one day, um, you are really spreading out that time period and you're being able to chase ballots effectively um, where uh, you know somebody may have gotten a mail-in ballot, um, you know they haven't turned it in, that's you need to be able to uh, text them, uh, target them on digital, um, send them emails if we can knock on doors, knock on their doors, uh, and it's a different rhythm of campaigning because it, it is a different timeline and a different targeting method than, than the traditional um, election day uh, push uh, to get everybody out to vote. So um, it's one of those subtle things, like a practitioner angle on this, but it'll end up uh, potentially changing a lot of the projects that we do um, and certainly changing the rhythm of, of how we do it. And it's definitely something we're, we're keeping a strong eye on. So with that, if her connection is behaving, I will transition uh, over to Jessica for the next section. You're muted. That probably is also a problem. I'm gonna try. I'm having some ironically um, connection issues, but um, 
yeah, we wanted to talk a little bit about how folks on this call can help. Um, so if you advance, <clears throat> there's a couple, um, I think, standard ways, but we want to call them out. Um, one is that we send a weekly newsletter every Wednesday. We sort of always have and hopefully always will. Um, part of what's in that newsletter are, are opportunities for uh, people to volunteer on projects, on campaigns. Uh, we certainly send other emails directly to people that have matched skills, but if you're for some reason not receiving those Wednesday morning emails or if you're on the East Coast early afternoon, um, definitely check your spam or um, email info at techforcampaigns.org tonight um, and we'll make sure you're on the list because a lot of projects get filled very, very quickly. Actually, one of our um, KPIs, key performance indicators, is to fill projects in under a week. So um, if you wait three or four days, it's likely that the project is filled. Um, so that's very important. And similarly, uh, we have a new way now that we're a few years old for you to update your contact information. And we've begun actually texting people about projects um, because we're trying to fill them so quickly. And to Greg's point, um, we have an influx of demand right now, um, partially because of COVID. Um, and we just need to be able to know that we're um, sending emails and able to text. We're not giving your phone number or your email to any other organization. So don't worry about that. I know that's a concern in politics. That's some, not something we've ever done and nor plan to do. Um, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, and then a third thing is spreading the word. There's a tech for campaigns forward slash volunteer right on the top of the site. Um, we're always looking for more volunteers, um, but specifically email marketers, performance marketers and graphic designers, um, because we know <clears throat> we had already planned that those would be the most popular types of projects. Um, but we know with COVID, uh, not only are more campaigns going to want it, but they want it sooner. Uh, because there's just really no other options for them. So um, demand is definitely increasing and um, it, it gives opportunities for uh, you guys to get involved uh, on the volunteer side. Um, the other way to get involved if you advance <coughs> is um, through donating. So because um, we're a nonprofit and we rely on donors to fund the organization, um, COVID is definitely a part of um, impacting us as well. States and campaigns um, at the state level will actually be left behind if we don't help them. So if you think about what Greg was saying earlier, there's an increase in demand uh, for digital and the talent pool um, for Democrats on the digital side has not grown. And so the campaigns that will lose out are the, are the campaigns that raise the least amount of money uh, that's usually state campaigns. So this will be a year where um, if we don't help these campaigns, they won't get help at all. And so we have both the state's fund and the tech infrastructure fund if you want to help fund tools or if you want to help fund directly to the states. Um, both are on our website. Just click the button to donate. Um, and if you have any questions, you can also email info at. But just to give you a sense of what dollars can do, I think Greg mentioned how cost effective things are. But Every $100 can fund a week of digital campaign team. $1,000 literally funds two digital campaign teams. So um, as far as like knowing where your dollars go and knowing that they're highly impactful, um, it's hard to actually compete with um, how Tech for Campaigns uses the funds. So um, it's just a really important part for us to scale up. We're not gonna take on more states until we know we have funding for those states right now. That's just the COVID era has ushered that in as well. So um, we will be able to help all the states that need help, but it, if we raise the funding. So this is just a hugely important part of um, what we do and being a supporter and being involved. So I'll, I'll thank you guys in advance for, for donating and, and being helpful there. And I think with that, we'll let you guys ask some questions. Um, I know there was a question for Representative Tellerico. Um, he unfortunately had to jump, but um, I think in terms of what does 
Representative Tallarico say about what the current crisis means to the state and the nation? I think he answered that um, at the end of his comments by saying he really thinks that there's been a failure in terms of taking care of people um, and in favor of taking care of the individual and he really wants to see that shift. Yeah, and I got one question um, from Tim Clark via email um, about how the candidate selection or campaign volunteer uh, selection process works. Uh, Michael, do you want to kind of just go over? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like that? So, so Jessica alluded to this in, in encouraging everybody to update their profiles because there are two ways that, that volunteers can get matched with campaigns. Um, one of those is projects get listed in the weekly newsletter that you can watch for on Wednesdays. Uh, and the other is that when we're work, looking for folks to volunteer with a campaign, um, particularly if they're in those key skill set areas um, like graphic designers or, or marketers and copywriters, um, we will reach out directly to people um, either by email or by text message um, when we can. We try to match that to folks who are in the same geography or, or have a connection to that place. Um, but that is really the impact of, of having your profile up to date is that you'll help us match you with the, the right projects for you. Awesome. And then I think we have a, another question. Sorry, go for it, Jessica. Oh, no, I was going to say um, a question for Greg. How many states are currently being supported by TFC? So maybe you can answer how many states we're currently supporting, how many we'd like to support. Then I have to count. That's hard. Um, so we are currently supporting, uh, and I, I do this from now, probably this one, uh, the Pennsylvania House, uh, the North Carolina Senate, uh, Michigan House, and a few races in the Missouri House and Senate, uh, and, and the Alaska House, which is a, a fun one. Um, so in the, in the Alaska House, uh, they have a, actually, despite a Republican governor, uh, Republican overall culture and tradition, um, and Republican Senate, they actually have a progressive majority in the House. And um, it's, a, it's a delicate balance there. Um, but one that's able to deliver a lot of needed government services for folks. And this is definitely uh, in a, a region that um, kind of, or in a, a sort of world where uh, they are not getting a lot of resources, um, very money, money star generally, and our uh, work is able to have a really huge impact um, there that, uh, you know, benefits the state. Um, so from there, that's the kind of, that's the core group of, of states that we have uh, kind of locked and loaded uh, for, for this cycle that are essentially funded, as Jessica mentioned, um, that to add them, we need additional funding. Uh, the next on the additional funding list are the Texas House, the Florida House and Senate, um, and most likely the Minnesota Senate. Um, and from there, we've talked to a bunch of other states like uh, New Hampshire, uh, Michael's home, <laughs> um, uh, home, home state, uh, New Mexico House, um, uh, and, and a few other places that, and Georgia, um, and a few other places like that. So, uh, as Jessica mentioned, we have to we have to make sure that we fund um, our current obligations in such a crazy time, um, and then uh, look to support to enable uh, the next cohort of states uh, that we have on deck. And then from there, um, you know, it's really up to the amount of resources that we're able to recruit and put in place as a nonprofit, uh, given the sort of boundless uh, enthusiasm and number of of our volunteers. And I'll just add, like, with with funding, we could start, like, there's, uh, Texas wants us to start, Florida wants us to start, Minnesota wants us to start, you know, right away. So it's not, there's no lack of appetite on the state side. That is correct. Awesome. We got another question as well about volunteers opportunities for entry level volunteers like college students, which is a, a great question. Now, most of our volunteer opportunities are for folks who are mid-career and, and already skilled professionals at something in the digital realm. Um, especially though, as we get close to the election, uh, we do sometimes have opportunities for projects like texting projects where there is more need to do potentially mass outreach or, or help with that. Um, so do keep an eye out uh, because there may well be things um, as we get toward November. Cool, any other questions that you guys want us to answer, you can type in now. Um, 
one thing I just want to um, mention is, you know, uh, the Tech for Campaigns team is working remotely too and uh, are all affected by this. So I just want to give all of them a shout out and thank them for um, working tirelessly through this pandemic to help campaigns through this pandemic. Everyone's affected. So I think everyone um, on the Tech for Campaigns core team deserves a shout out too. And Sometimes people forget that um, how hard they work. We have a question from Larissa. Um, so we work with the uh, folks. When I re let's first repeat the oh, question. That's a great point. <laughs> I forget the Zoom doesn't let me see it. Uh, Larissa is asking, what makes an ideal candidate for TSU systems? Um, so we go into each, well, one thing we've learned um, over and over again is that every state is their own little world and, and kind of um, how the politics work there uh, do tremendously differ. Um, so we are focused on flipping uh, state, like legislative control, moving a state from Republican to Democrat um, in, in a state house or in a state Senate. Uh, that can happen this year, can happen you know, over a longer period of time. And we're also focused on breaking um, Super majorities, uh, which are when Republicans control uh, more uh, than two thirds of the vote in a certain chamber. Um, and there's a post from a couple, couple of years ago. It's like whether well, when super majorities are when terrible things happen. Um, it's it's basically when, when Democrats have, have no control over the budget, no control at all, and and sort of the far right um, take over. So that's the way we prioritize um, our overall engagement um, throughout the country. And then as we get into each chamber. Uh, we end up talking to the folks there, um, state legislative caucuses, Democratic parties, um, folks who are stakeholders there on the ground uh, to identify who the um, opportunities are in order to move the number of Democrats in, in those seats higher. Um, so that means that people do sort of differ tremendously um, in sort of their background, age, gender, um, interest, level, you know, interest in, in policy and stuff. Um, but we are kind of keeping our eye on the big picture towards towards moving um, the, the overall numbers. Um, so that's that's one thing. I mean, practically has to be, is the sort of uh, folks that um, that are up for election. You'd be surprised how many people are, are not up for competitive elections, which is just one, one factor that goes into it um, and really narrows down the list. And the other thing is that um, even the races that we're not able to support directly with volunteers, we're able to touch through building software through some targeted software tools. So we've got uh, software tools for helping campaign fundraise. Uh, we've got software tools for helping monitor what's going on um, in, in the Facebook advertising world. And we've got software to help um, monitor field activity, uh, the, the door knocks that we're, we're so you know, badly missing right now um, through, through software. And so those tools are a way that we're able to impact um, hundreds, thousands of campaigns at scale um, in a complementary fashion with the uh, direct volunteer assistance that where we're, you know, working with somebody like Representative Tallarico to, um, you know, build their website, manage their email program, um, or, or do advertising. So, any last questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, well, we really appreciate everyone joining us tonight and um, we hope you got learned something from both Greg and the entire team, but also Representative Tellerico. Um, we're hugely appreciative of your support. Uh, reach out anytime at, to info at or if you're on Slack, um, you can reach out to anyone there. Um, and again, I know that everyone wants to be part of a project and volunteer, but um, we're super grateful that 20% of our volunteers are also donors. And that's just usually important because um, with COVID, the funding uh, is going to be much harder for campaigns, but also for TFC. Um, and we'll be able to help a lot more campaigns if um, we have more supporters. So with that, um, we'll let you guys uh, enjoy the rest of your night. And thank you all for your continued help. Thank you, everybody. Bye.